Obviously, you've spent quite a long time inside the sort of world of um, what you called grievance studies and postmodernism. Um, I'm really interested in what you've learned during that time and what you think. I mean, how important do you think this, or how how serious do you think this is as a as a as something we need to look at? And what do you think are the main characteristics of postmodernism or this kind of scholarship? I think, well, the, the main characteristics of it are a belief in the cultural constructedness of knowledge. So knowledge isn't something that's out there to be found, it's something that humans make with their language. And this works in the service of power. So particularly the postmodern ideas will go against Christianity, uh, but also Marxism and also science. They will say these have undue power, they're accepted as truths, they're dangerous and they want to pick them all apart. So because of that, we see understandings of categories that have, we've accepted as distinct as actually blending into each other. The things like um, fact and fiction, reason and emotion, we're not separating these in postmodernism. There's that really intense focus on language as, um, as dangerous as a constructor of things. We, and we've got quite a loss of both humanism and individuality we're not to see each other as fellow human beings with individual characteristics that we can like, dislike, agree with, disagree with. Now it's all about knowledge as attached to identity. So a black person will have um, authoritative knowledge on racism and uh, she just has to be believed. Of course, the problem with this immediately is that if you have two black people and ask them a question, they're not going to agree because they are actually individuals. So that, that's what we're seeing quite a lot from... Um, from postmodernism, I think it is a serious problem, not in the extent that it's a, a majority belief, but I think it's, it's coming into wider society. We've lost quite a lot of the expectation to give evidence for a claim, to make it reasoned, and to be able to talk to each other on the, on the basis of ideas. We're seeing more and more that people are asking, well, who are you, a straight white man, to, to address this issue? That's in complete contradiction to the liberal marketplace of ideas. So I, I am concerned about it, but I think what worries me most is that people don't really understand how it works because it's so counterintuitive. And I think we need to break it down and make people able to get at it, and then we'll be able to, to counter it. Do you get a sense that things are starting to shift? Because there's, it's, it certainly seems that there's more awareness of this in the culture than there was before. And do you get a sense that things are starting to shift and, and people's minds are starting to change around this? Yes, I'm just worried about where it's going to shift to. Because since um, about 2010, but really escalating over the last few years, the social justice ideas have got stronger, more assertive and clearer. So people can get at them. That's the good thing. We can now see what they are and we can argue with them without being accused of straw manning. There's no obscurantist language or ambiguity. It's very clear. And the bad thing about this is that it's, it's highly contagious. Young idealistic students particularly can grasp this and, and absorb it. But I think that that does move us into the stage of, of pushback, of culture war, rather than cultural confusion, which has been what we're seeing. So my concern at the moment is that I, I think there's going to be a big pushback at social justice, and I want it to come from the liberal left rather than the populist right. And I see at the moment people surging right, as you know, the UK and the US, we've, we've had a surge right. We, we have conservative parties in now. People are expressing less confidence in left-wing parties. And I, I think this is partly to do with the kind of social justice ideas that are coming from them. So I want the liberal left to push back at them. Otherwise, I fear that the anti-intellectual right, the populist right, could become more attractive to more people. It could even push back uh, racial equality, gender equality, LGBT equality. And that is, is what we want to try and stop while I do. <laughs> what does that look like, a pushback from the left and the centre left? I think it, it looks like an unembarrassed assertion of belief in the marketplace of ideas, in science, in reason, in evidence, in progress. You know, it, it's supposed to be embarrassingly naive now to believe in Enlightenment ideas. And that's because they are presented so childishly in, in sort of in sort of caricature by the social justice left. But actually, if we are looking at 
how these what these ideas have done for society the idea of universal liberalism of requiring evidence to make a truth claim of requiring arguments to be reasoned these are not embarrassing ideas and the progress they have made is measurable so we need liberals to be confident enough in saying i don't accept your epistemology i don't accept your ethics these are the ones I do accept. And I think that would cause reasonable people who have gone right to come back. I think that's all we can do to win them back. And isn't there a really difficult um, needle to be threaded here? Because I'm assuming when you say, oh, we need to push back against these social justice ideas, what people will hear you saying is, I want to push back against social justice. Isn't that the catch-22 that... It is. That's why um, we've written so many... Uh, pieces like no identity politics does not continue the work of the civil rights movement. It's actually being helped at the moment that so many social justice people are critical of liberalism. So they're not calling themselves liberals and in America they tend to lump liberal um, with the social justice left and that's a bit more confusing. But over here we're doing better with distinguishing liberals from identitarians. But you just, I think we just have to keep spelling that out very clearly. And this is, this is what uh, James and I have done in our book at the end. We do believe that racial equality matters. We do believe we are not there yet. We don't believe this is the way to do it. So I think we just have to keep on spelling out. You can, um, you can focus on social justice. You can think society is unjust and want to fix that without going for a social justice movement approach which is rooted in postmodern ideas. So is the problem not with the ideas but with the ideology or is it in the ideas? Well, at the root cause, we're with them. They, they want racial equality, they want gender equality. So that, those core values are they're, they're shared by everybody on the left and quite a few people on the right. So it's not those that are the problem, it is the way of distinguishing um, what is a problem and what isn't, the way of reading, assuming that racism will be in everything, assuming that sexism will be, and then reading things in order to find them. And um, you know, wanting to censor people, wanting to have culturally relative ethics, ignoring the, individ the individual and the, and, and the whole sort of humanist ideal. That, that is the problem that I think it's clear is just going to make more divisions and make it harder to address any problems that are there. I mean, I do see uh, a lot of my friends who are in a lot of these kind of activist communities that were sort of very heavily social justice ideology influenced, starting to realize at the very least it's tactically not working, that it's creating the, the wrong, Im like you could argue that it was, heavily influ it was heavily influential in the election of Trump, you could argue it was heavily influential in Brexit, this sort of sense of shaming and um, kind of judging a lot of people who didn't think the same way about social justice and diversity issues. Yeah. Um, I do see that happening. I do wonder whether it's going to be f fast enough and what the medium term, because the medium term effect looks almost certain to be the re-election of Trump as far as I can see, because what you're seeing in America is just this doubling down on the left of, oh wow, it's far more racist and sexist and bigger than we ever realized. While it seems quite clear to me that a lot of the reaction is anti-political correctness. That's why people are voting for Trump. So I do see that happening in some of these communities, but I also wonder if it's going to happen fast enough. I have a bit more hope um, for the UK because we have a stronger um, socialist left. It's been bigger and, and more well established and it's getting more positive towards the left liberals. There is productive conversation going on between uh, centrists, left liberals, and economic lefties, socialist lefties. So I think that we could, uh, between us, push out the identitarian left. I think that could happen. I'm not sure that could happen in the US because they have a different relationship with socialism. They have the whole Red Scare thing uh, going on. They're, they are, they're economic left hasn't got the prestige to actually stand up and push back at the identitarian left and a lot of uh, American centrists and, and right-wingers can't even don't even know there's a difference so I, I think it's much more messy there I don't think this is going to be a quick fix in the US and you're a professor of philosophy at Portland University you're probably best known for Portland State Portland State University you're probably best known for 
the what's called the grievance studies papers. Can you give a little bit of a background on that? What and how how would you introduce yourself? Well, before I did the grievance studies thing, I was heavily involved in the atheist movement. And so to understand the grievance studies, I think it's really important to understand the rise and fall of the atheist movement. So grievance studies, we submitted as James Lindsay, Helen Pluckrose and I over 10 months, wrote around 250,000 words, 20 papers, and we submitted them to peer-reviewed journals to test the process to whistleblow, if you will, to see if intentionally broken, absurd papers would get published. And seven were published or, and accepted by the time the Wall Street Journal found out about it, and then we came clean, and seven more were under review. And the idea there was to expose shoddy scholarship, corrupt scholarship, uh, agenda-driven scholarship. But one of the things we realized from coming from the atheist movement was that social justice with an uppercase S and an uppercase J had, it really is a parasitic ideology and it had woven its way, ironically enough, into the atheist movement and caused schisms and fractures within that movement. And so what we did was, the purpose of writing those was to test our own ideas. Maybe these folks are onto something that we haven't figured out. Maybe they really, there really is something there. And the way to do that was to call pen testing, penetration testing, to see if it works. So we wrote those papers, and then we now have our, our answer to that question. Mm. Because, I mean, the, the, I've seen sort of strong criticisms of that. The, the, I think there was an editorial in the Times Literary Supplement, maybe, and some people saying that what you proved wasn't what you said that you've proved, and I'm sure there's, there's other people who've questioned what you did. Have you had any dialogues with your, your books about impossible conversations? Have you had any dialogues with your critics over this? Uh, dialogues, no. I mean, I've been brought up on trial, and I've been brought up three times, and I'm about to be brought up again. Uh, for additional ethical violations and charges. And that conversation starter, that conversation remains on the table. When we did the James Damore event with Helen Pluckrose and Heather Hying and I at PSU, we invited folks from the Women's Studies Department to come and have that dialogue. They didn't. We invited them two days later to come with Helen Pluckrose and James Lindsay and myself. They didn't come. Sorry. We invited them two days later, February 19th, with James Lindsay and Helen Pluckrose and myself to come to that conversation. They didn't. When we did the Mythicist Milwaukee event, we tried to find someone from the women's studies departments or people who have published in this area specifically or any adjacent areas in grievance studies. We couldn't find anybody to have a conversation with us. And that is on the table, that offer to have a conversation, not a debate, but a conversation. Although the Mythicist Milwaukee was a debate. But we can't find anybody to have a, who's willing to have a conversation with us. And one of the things we talk about in the book is you can't force someone to have a conversation with you if you, they don't want to have a conversation. You, you can't you know, kidnap them and stick them at a table. Because hmm. this, I think, is a really good place to start because we're actually talking about a real-world example of either impossible conversations or those conversations not being had. And what, why do you think that no one wants to talk to you about this? It could be that they view me as an inherently disagreeable fellow. Uh, it could be fear of losing an argument. Uh, it could be platforming, which is another idea that's very common. We don't want to give someone who has a different belief a platform. It could be my, my strongest suspicion is that these folks don't know the other side of the argument, and so they've been indoctrinated. They don't value open discourse, dialogue, reason, Socratic interactions, uh, they look at education as an ideology mill, and they're agenda-driven. That's my strongest um, conjecture. That I, I, I'm not positive of the percentage of the role, like in a pie chart, like how big of a cut of pie that would be, but I'm, I'm fairly confident it's a sizable cut of that pie. So you're, you're basically asking for someone to discuss with now. I hope someone does come out. That's basically what the letter wiki... Um, project is about having those conversations and matching up people with opposing views. So I hope 
we're, we'll call someone out now. I'll try and put some of the criticisms that someone might raise to you. Um, but I think it would be much better if someone from that, that environment came forward. Let me pause you right there and say not just anybody. Um, because people will say, well, you're punching down. Why, why haven't you had a conversation with someone who's published in these areas? So I'm happy to have a conversation with somebody who's specifically published in the journals in which we hoax might not be the, exactly the, the best word, but the, the person with whom I'm having that discussion, they need to, they, they can't be a random person. So they need to have some qualifications to be able to speak in the area. And that looks like, uh, I, ideally that they, they would rep, replicate what we did. If you, you have, you know, a bunch of pub, peer reviewed publications in the journals in which we've published, Hypatia would be a great one. Then Helen Pluckrose, James Lindsay and myself, my fellow co-authors would be happy to have that conversation with you. Mm. And I've seen you on Twitter, uh, talk about the fact that you, um, find it quite peculiar or, or unusual that you've now got enemies. Um, how's, how's it been for you over the last kind of couple of years of, having more increased prominence with the grievance studies thing and, and realizing that a lot of people are not happy with that. Yeah, it, 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 is, it is quite difficult in, in some ways. I mean, I, I, I can deal with um, people telling me I'm... On one side, they tend to tell me I'm a Nazi and a fascist. On the other side, they tend to point out I'm fat. So I can, I can deal with those kind of uh, random insults. But there are committed uh, stalkers so, so, and I have to block a, a lot of people and then there is just this kind of collective of people who just really seem to put an awful lot of energy into misinterpreting everything I say, presenting it in the least charitable way, screenshotting things out of context and it, it just really is quite disturbing to know that there are people who will put this much energy into attacking things that I don't mean and haven't said and would actually be delighted if something terrible were to happen to me that that's quite an uncomfortable thought and um, somebody came back to me when I said this on Twitter and, and she said um, we, you get what you give you're a, a, a deeply unpleasant person I thought that that isn't really true if I got what I give what I would get is people telling me that my my epistemology, my ways of knowing are wrong and that my ethics are wrong. They would be polite, they would respond to what I actually said. I could deal with that. What I can't deal with is people... Today, yeah, today apparently I, I supported Nazis because I said that uh, nearly everybody wants good things for society and so that was taken off and run with. And it's, it's just really difficult to... To, it, it bothers me. I think the other two are better at ignoring than I am. I, I feel like if something is being presented wrongly, I have, to, I have to put it right, and that's something I've got to stop doing. There's one other thing I'd like to raise about, there's a lot of, I see a lot of accusations of bad faith being lobbed around. Yes, and, and grifter. Yeah, grifter and bad faith. Um, and also, I mean, I'm, I'm interested to unpack that. I also see the accusation of bad faith to, it, it almost, from people on, in the centre and maybe the centre-right, and it almost seems the equivalent of the kind of no platforming coming from the left. Do you, do you think, I mean, my sense is that if someone is genuinely arguing in bad faith, surely we can, we can have a discussion and that, that will be exposed if that's the case. I have no problem with, I know this is going to sound weird, but I have no problem with someone arguing in bad faith. That, that's not my problem. Let, so, let, so you just said a huge, a lot. So let's unpack that. The first thing you said, well, my response to what you said was grifter. So that's a term I'm accused of grifting constantly. And when I first heard it, I was so baffled by it because I thought it was you receiving some kind of remuneration, financial money or something. And I was baffled by it because I did the grievance studies thing for no money that new atheism, I did an app, Atheos, for no money. All the stuff, I don't have a Patreon, I don't have a PayPal, I haven't taken a penny from anyone. I could not understand where this gr grifting accusation came from. And I keep thinking, well, geez, maybe I don't understand. And I was incorrect. I, I didn't understand it. I was correct that I didn't understand it. So grifting means, the, and correct me if you want to throw out an, an, uh, another interpretation of this, it means that... There's some idea in the zeitgeist 
that you have latched onto, not because you happen to believe it, but because you think it gives you social and maybe even intellectual currency to advance that idea. So the, the, the problem with that is one, it assumes that people know your motivations. That there's, only you can know your motivations. The other problem with that is it's a convenient excuse to not do intellectual work to engage their arguments. So someone has just said something, they've made an argument, grifter or Nazi, right? So you, you, we, we have a little label, a smear label, we place someone in a box, don't have to engage. It's a way, it's an anti-dialectical tool that people use to avoid argument or engaging ideas at all. So that's the first thing. The second thing you said, what was the second thing again? Um, was it the bad faith? Yeah, the arguments in bad faith. Yeah. So, or, or refusing to engage with people because you, you've already pre-decided that everything that they're saying is in bad faith, which I've seen on, on all sides of, of, the, of the aisle. Yeah, um, I think, okay. So let's take a look at that. If refusing to engage with somebody because you believe that they're a bad faith actor is one thing, but engaging with someone you believe is acting in bad faith is another. So the problem I, I see the more egregious problem by far of refusing to engage some, someone because you think they're acting in bad faith. In my experience, I have found that that is because people are intellectually afraid. There's a kind of fear response. So that's why they don't want to engage and they'll use anything as a convenient excuse to justify not engaging. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that, with the, with the, the examples that I'm thinking about. Um, and I, I also wanted to ask as well, because you're, you are quite, quite heavily criticized on Twitter. I saw a few kind of backwards and forwards. And I know that Eric Weinstein and Sam Harris have talked about this quite a lot, that actually, again, especially Sam is obviously attacked quite a lot and he feels that he's actually, his sense making is getting worse and worse because he's finding it more and more difficult to distill the good quality criticism from the bad quality criticism. Do you worry about that? Do you think that might be happening to you as well? I worry deeply, deeply about that. That is one of my primary concerns. One of my primary concerns is I've gotten so much rage and hatred that um, I've just tuned those people out. But yet I desperately need those people. I have to have those voices to, to, that's the corrective mechanism in my head. That takes me out of delusion. But when everyone's telling me I'm a moron, a grifter, and a Nazi, constantly, it, it, it's, we, we all need that feedback to keep ourselves in check. And as much as I have tried to not invoke a defensive posture, I even find myself tone policing things and I can't stand that about myself. But yet I don't know, I really don't know what to do about that because everybody, myself included, you know, when you take strong stances about things, you absolutely need feedback from the other side. But when that feedback com comes in, in terms of, as Nietzsche said, you know, philosophizing with a hammer, when the, you're just getting hammered all the time, it, it's very difficult to um, sincerely reflect on your, to take those comments and sincerely reflect on those, those ideas. So I'm deeply concerned about that. Do you have any thoughts of any solutions to that? Wiki letter is one. Having a, a place where you can go where the conversations are more civil. Um, I'm also deeply concerned that I, I have muted people who... Um, I really would like to hear what they say, but all I'm getting is sworn at and told I'm a moron constantly. Um, I, I don't really know what the solution is other than listening first and being willing to have conversations with those folks. Um, and then I think that does get back to this idea that when you, that people are acting in bad faith and when you go to have a conversation with them, it's, it's meant as some kind of a trap to humiliate you as opposed to really get to the root of the problem. I don't really know uh, on a large scale via social media, I don't really know what to do about that. And what would you say, what was your kind of um, 
journey to becoming concerned about this or becoming really aware of this? Well, I went back to university quite late and I, I studied English literature and we learnt postmodernism and I immediately had a lot of disagreements with that. My, my tutors, to their credit, were very patient with my disagreements, but I, um, I found it increasingly difficult to do anything that didn't use theory. So we were taught ways of reading. And so you can read a text through a post-colonial lens or through a feminist lens, and the idea is confirmation bias. Pick out the bits of the text that fit your narrative, make it work, and this, this is a good thing. So I was quite concerned about that. Then at, at postgraduate, I was, I was reassured that one of my professors said to me, we're not doing postmodernism, it's silly. However, when I then attempted to write an essay about the benefits of evolutionary psychological um, literary analysis, I, uh, by doing a reading of Othello, I was told that I was very problematically um, destining women to a beauty myth and that the, the studies that I'd shown which says racism is not innate and can be overcome by uh, shared goals was actually very problematic to um, uh, black communities in America. I was talking about 1601 in England, but these ideas, they, they couldn't be... They, they weren't allowed, so I got the lowest grade I'd ever got with anything. It was made clear to me that if I tried to bring science, um, the biology, into things at all, and I didn't instead use the approved types of theories, that I couldn't get a master's. And who, who are the, the sort of central thinkers and central ideas of postmodernism? I mean, a lot of people are probably aware of it through Jordan Peterson kind of talking about it a lot, and he mentions Foucault and Derrida mm -hmm. a lot. But, but I think you'd include a few thinkers who've come after them, would you? Yeah, we, we see um, the three waves of it. So at the beginning, yet yeah, there was Baudrillard, uh, Lyotard, Foucault, Derrida, and, and several others, and they, they came from different places, but they had the same kind of ideas about power, knowledge, and language. Then, in the late 80s, there was a second wave of this, because the first lot, they were fairly aimless. They were despairing. They wanted to pull things apart. They didn't have any plans to put them back together again. So, in around 19, 18, 1990, we had um, Judith Butler, we had Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, we see in post-colonialism, Gayatri Spivak and Homi Baba, and people, these kind of theorists who are suddenly putting post modern ideas, post-structuralist ideas specifically, into a kind of activism. So Kimberley Crenshaw is the best for this because she was so explicit about it. In her foundational text for um, intersectionality, she, she, well, she described it as um, contemporary politics linked to postmodern theory. And she said that what was good about postmodernism was seeing everything as a cultural construct and a construct of power, but we can't have everything um, being constructed. Some things have to be real. Some things have to be objectively true if we're going to do anything. So to this next wave of theorists, there was still the cultural constructivism, but the systems of power and privilege were objectively true. So this has now made a way in which people can, um, can do activism, can do scholarship. They assume that it is always there, there is always a power imbalance between people with different identities. And the idea is to get at it, look at it and pull it apart. And that works in different ways in the different fields. And then at around 2010, we've seen a further solidification of this. And it's, it's got much more uh, it's got clearer, we haven't got that sort of obscure language, and much more assertive. And so we see in the work of people like Barbara Applebaum and Alison Bailey and Robin D'Angelo, there is just an assertion, this is how it is. You are white, you are racist, you can't help but be racist. You know, this is absolute certainty, which wouldn't have come with the original postmodernists. They were radically sceptical and uncertain of everything. So it's a kind of solidification of postmodernism. Um, I'm hearing some echoes of, of what Jordan Peterson says about postmodernism, which is that postmodernism it, post itself doesn't give you a value system. So what they're doing is smuggling in Marxism, and he talks about neo-Marxism and postmodernism being, uh, or postmodernism being a new um, disguise for 
for neo-Marxism. Do you agree with that or do you disagree? I, I, I disagree with that. You won't find any economic or class analysis in the kind of thing that we're, we're seeing at the moment and that, that really is at the bottom of, of Marxism. Rather than um, smuggling anything else in, what has happened is that ideas have solidified. So it has become more um, totalitarian, but it isn't. It's not. It's not hiding anything else. So the Marxists and socialist materialist scholars are really not very happy with the postmodernists at all. And there's a constant battle going on between between the two of them. Because the one, the Marxists, they want to look at economics. They want to look at class. They want to look at law and solid. Um, things in society, material reality in society that's affecting people. And to them, all of this focus on race, sexuality and gender is a bourgeois attempt to remove the issues from the working class, take them into the universities and then squabble about high earning people and who's doing better than, than each other. So the Marxists really are not fans of postmodernists. But the other way round, the postmodernists will occasionally cite Marxists or uh, give credit to Marxists because anti-capitalism is one of their, their aims, but it's not a dominant one. There isn't much support for working class white men. Because mm. I, I would argue, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in this as well, that what Jordan, and I wonder whether this is a kind of terminology thing, because I think what Jordan Peterson, what I hear him talking about is the idea of equity, the idea of uh, collectivism. And I wonder whether there might be a common, that it's not that neo-Marxism is informing postmodernism, but there's some sort of common ancestor or some common habit of thought which wants equity, which wants um, to, yeah, that, 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 that so, so it's not that it is actually Marxism, it's that there may be some common ancestor or common way of thinking. Well, I think, I think there is, but in philosophical terms, which, which I don't get into because I'm not that well informed on it, but there's certainly um, Hegel in there with his whole um, sort of slave master thing. So that, that underlies both of them. That could be a common ancestor. We have got the idea of oppressed and oppressor classes and about power structures. So it isn't, I, I think that the first postmodernists were disillusioned Marxists. But it has gone in a completely different direction with different methods, different ways of attaining knowledge. And so I think it is less useful to point out the common commonalities as to point out the differences. Because if you try arguing with a postmodernist on Marxist grounds, they're just going to agree with you. They, they, don't, they don't believe what the Marxists believe. So it, it really is quite important and it's not that difficult to, to understand how knowledge and language and, um, and power are conceived in postmodernism itself. And is there an issue here with, so we've talked about the tensions a little bit in the dialogue itself and the idea of having these open dialogues or having these conversations, for example, on letter and elsewhere, that the, the hardcore postmodernists don't, postmodernists don't actually believe in that as a way of arriving at truth. Can you explain that? And uh, Peter said something interesting in the interview with me, which is that he would prefer to argue with any religious thinker because they are they are at least schooled in the arguments against their perspective. Like they, every every um, theologian would be able to put put both sides of the case, whereas he, he's not sure that most postmodernists are. No, I mean the the problem that we're seeing now, and particularly in the last ten years is that there is a belief that anybody who doesn't um, agree with the ideas of, of social justice, of S, capital S, capital J, the movement, um, is either fragile or trying to preserve privilege. If your understanding of how truth in society works is that there are all these different discourses and some of them are just accepted as true and then they run through everybody, Anybody who tries to argue with you will simply be seen as not having overcome this discourse, not having become woke to it. So you cannot really argue with that. And in, in our book, we look at, at three cases of this in which it is argued very straightforwardly that anybody who disagrees that society is formed this way is 
um, shouldn't be engaged with, they haven't understood, they're ignorant. So there are these words like, like white ignorance and uh, white fragility, and they're all sort of built to, to explain why disagreement isn't valid. So with Robin DiAngelo in particular, white fragility, the ways you can show you are fragile, there's, there's three of them. It can be by disagreeing with her, by uh, leaving, or by being quiet. Therefore, the only way not to be fragile is to stay put and agree that she's right. This isn't something that a marketplace of ideas can, can work with. Yeah, and I want to pick up, you kind of hinted at it there, and I think we, we discussed the other day, why you think this is so dangerous, why you think that the intersectionality code is so dangerous, because it actually shuts down these dialogues. That's exactly correct. There is no First Peter 3.15, there's no apologetic, not, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for the faith, my faith, but a defense, a robust defense of the faith. That's why there can never be an analog of a William Lane Craig of intersectionality, a great defender of intersectionality, because... Well, they don't value dialogue, they don't value discourse, uh, they don't, it's a different value system that they have coming into it. They also don't tend to hold to the correspondence theory of truth, so that beliefs stand in some kind of isomorphic relationship to truth. They, um, they don't, most importantly, they don't study the other side of the issue. They don't learn about what are the arguments against intersectionality, whereas any Literally any, every, every Christian apologist will do that. They'll know the arguments for and against atheism inside, outside, and backwards, and why they fail, or why they think they fail. So they'll be able to articulate that. Intersectionality and the, those proponents of intersectionality don't have that value. I think that's a really interesting point that I'd not really considered before. I just wanted to unpack the first thing you said there um, about the... I think the religion comparison is really interesting because it does, it does illustrate, I think you said to me before, that every, every sort of junior um, theologian, theologian in a seminary would know the arguments to, to rebut the, the kind of atheist case, but that's not the case with intersectionality. Not even those at the top of the top of the pyramid. They don't learn the other side of the issue, and they don't learn it by intention and design. And because they don't learn it, they certainly don't teach it. So it's, again, it's an ideology mill of self-replicating dogma. But making matters worse, it's become institutionalized. A sliver, a very small group of people have managed to institutionalize their dogma throughout the university system. And it's literally, literally crippling the system. The system is hobbled and crippled by third-rate ideologues, to be blunt. And what are you hoping for going forward? I mean, I think you've sketched out a lot of your fears going forward. What are you hoping for going forward? I'm hoping that we can get a kind of a kind of pushback from from the middle that liberal lefties and liberal righties, people who value science, reason and evidence and, and consistent principles, again, equal opportunities for everyone, can actually push back the people on their own sites that are, that are causing the problems, that they can say to the populists, no, this isn't an ethical conservatism that I want to see, that we can say to the social justice activists, this is not action for social justice. And we can try and push it out and, and have, what I would like is a, a left-wing party that respects reasonable conservatives, but you know, something that, that isn't this current polarizing madness. Helen, thank you very much for making the time. Yeah, no, thanks for talking to me. Rebel Wisdom is a new sense-making platform, bringing together the most rebellious and inspiring thinkers from around the world. If you're enjoying our content, then you can help us make more by becoming a subscriber, which will give you access to a load of exclusive films. Also, you can then join our group Zoom calls to discuss the ideas in the films, and you can send us ideas for questions for upcoming interviews. We're also looking for talented people to help us out with editing, graphics, music, that kind of thing. And if you're a regular viewer, you'll know we talk a lot about the value of embodying or actually living out the ideas that we talk about. So that's why we run regular events in London. Check out the links on the website for more. And hope to see you soon.